nine economic development committee meeting to order today's Wednesday, February 15th. And the 1st item of business would be the approval of the minutes of December 21st and January 18th. Um, without objection, are there any corrections or additions or no? Uh, noting without objection, we'll uh, receive and approve those minutes. We're moving on quickly now to item 2B, and that's our wayfinding presentation. And uh, Mr. Manager, Mr. Lilith, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're pleased to welcome our guests from Merge. Um, You'll recall that we uh, engaged Merge as our wayfinding signage consultant back in the fall to assist us with our wayfinding efforts, of course, with our goal to better assist visitors and residents um, to move around town and encourage them to stay and enjoy all of uh, that West Hartford offers today. So um, including shopping and dining, uh, historic sites, parks and trails, um, et cetera. Uh, what I'd like to do through you, Mr. Chairman, is turn it over to our economic development coordinator, uh, Kristen Gorski, to introduce our guests from Merch. Through you, Mr. Chairman, Kristen. Great. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Good morning. Um, as Rick had said, uh, we are joined today by a principal with Merge, Glenn Swantak. Um, so I'm excited to be able to turn it over to him in a couple minutes to give a presentation. Just to explain a little bit, um, in addition to what the manager's comments were. Um, so Merge was chosen through a competitive process. Again, um, this is funded through ARPA funds. Um, uh, Merge is the co consultant for this project, and they are going to help us to map out an actual design plan for implementation. Um, so Merge is their national experts in holistic design um, that merges graphic design with built environments, um, and they have gotten off to a really great start um, to date with this project. We held um, several stakeholder groups back in December. Those were broken out into three separate categories. Those were business, nonprofits and tourism, arts and culture, and then municipal. So those served as roundtables to be able to get feedback information um, from those really important stakeholders within our community on those different subject matter areas in terms of what do you see now you know what could we enhance what could we add so on and so forth in addition to that um, and glenn will get into this in a part of his presentation, um, we had a survey to the community that was open for a little bit over a month. We received 344 responses. So Glenn will go over the results of that survey. Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, I would like to turn it over to Glenn Swantak to give a presentation to the committee. And then afterwards, um, we would love to get some questions, feedback, insights from members of the committee on this particular project. Glenn? Thank you, Ms. Korski. Thank uh, you. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Glenn Swantek. I'm principal with Merge. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, just have a brief um, visual presentation because that's what we do. We're visual people. <laughs> um, so uh, Merge, uh, let me know if my screen is moving. Can you, can you all see that there? Okay, great. Yeah, Merge, we are an environmental graphic design firm. We focus on communities, trails, and transit projects across the United States. We've got, um, um, you know, large city um, experience from downtown Phoenix to uh, New Orleans to smaller communities uh, around the country. Um, we also have um, experience in Connecticut, uh, in New Haven, Norwalk, Westport, and um, Mansfield. Uh, stores Connecticut. So we we have worked with you know the uh, DOT on on a lot of our projects. Um, when you think of wayfinding, sometimes you think it's just all about the signage, and and that's really not what it is. It is a holistic approach that we look at. You know, we're always looking before you get to uh, West Hartford. You know, you're getting on your computer. You're looking at where you're going to go. You're using tourism websites. You're using interactive maps. When you arrive, you're using place technology like your GPS um, or you know mobile apps. Um, the environment plays a, a huge role in wayfinding. Um, you know how you get uh, around, whether they're landmarks or districts or destinations or architecture. Um, and then there's also support information like visitor guides, maps, street elements, bus shelters, 
but then also the signage. What we're doing is a, a comprehensive signage plan. We're looking at all aspects of wayfinding and signage from gateways, vehicular parking, kiosks, interpretive, um, bike paths, and pedestrian. So it is going to be. This is going to be a comprehensive uh, plan. Uh, I just want to show you some examples of our work, and it just sort of shows you the the scale and scope, and and just you know some of the um, ideas that maybe you could have for uh, West Hartford. So you know arrival gateways into a downtown area, promoting shopping, down, dining, and arts. Um, this could be into a district, or it could be a gateway. Um, it can be something monumental, or it can be just a post and panel sign that has a, a, some of the character of the place, like in Frederick, Maryland, where it's more of a Civil War historic community. Um, also, you know, when you're thinking about vehicular signs, we are very aware of the MUTCD and uh, type size, reflectivity, um, you know, using um, arrow placement. But we do it in a way where uh, we follow that, but we also are able to bring in um, creative elements. But then also in a historic context, when you're in a historic downtown area, you want to make sure that those signs are appropriate. You don't want big double post signs that are, you know, in a, in an area that is, um, that is, uh, more historic or a district or residential. Parking signage is part of this. And, uh, you know, there's always a, uh, a spectrum of design when you talk about parking. Uh, there's the standard P arcing sign that the, you know, the DOT always uh, has and, and puts up, but you can do enhanced versions or even custom versions like we did in Savannah, Georgia, which has more of a character of the parking system. So we're creating really a parking P that is uh, a system that whenever you see that, you know, that that's where you're going to get public parking. Um, identifying lots, um, all the parking lots, you know, you know, a town hall lot, for example, but you want to say what lot you're parking at and always saying that it is public parking because sometimes there are shared use lots that, um, you know, certain hours of the day you can park and certain hours you can't. So we want to look at all of that information. Kiosks, you get out of your car, you start walking as a pedestrian, you either have a map or you promote events or you say what district you're in. Um, so there's there's opportunities with kiosks to even cross market districts within West Hartford. We design all of our maps as well. Um, they can be simple, or in this case in Fredericksburg, Texas, they can be a little more complicated where they are actually listing the shops that are on this map. They had a, a mechanism in place that was able to update this. And that's always the, the case, you know, when you have something um, that where businesses are constantly changing, you know, you won't always want to have that mechanism in place. Um, pedestrian signs, uh, this is in New Haven. These were just installed this past year, um, you know, identifying the district, giving a walking distance in minutes, not in blocks, because blocks are always different. Some in blocks in Dallas, Texas are different than blocks in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, bike ped or bicycle signs, uh, you know, um, whether that, you know, creating a brand of the bicycle system. So, you know, in this case, this is in Rehoboth Beach. Park signs using pictographs to uh, show the amenities that are within each park and then also using the brand or the identity of the community at these entrances so that it, you you know that it's a formal you know uh, city-owned park and this is in whistler uh, canada identifying trailheads um, we like to do this not only to let people know when they have arrived but also if say you're driving by on a roadway especially when you're in say a, a downtown area where you, you might be driving by and you say oh, i didn't know there was a trailhead over there or, i didn't know there was a trail there so it, it's just a, it acts as a purpose for identification as well and then you might come back and then use the use the trail and then as you're along the trail of course having those um, mile markers and uh, and also directing to destinations that are off of the trail um, like say into a downtown area Interpretive signs uh, are, are, are part of this kit, you know, um, we always, you know, like to look for the story of a place and try and incorporate that into what we do. Sidewalk compasses, um, crosswalks, these are all wayfinding elements. You might not want to do all of these things, but, you know, we, we we're just showing this as examples of what could potentially happen. Uh, 
Sculpture can act as a wayfinding tool. Um, murals, you know, in this case, this was in downtown Frederick where they, they actually hid their parking garage very well. <laughs> so it was very hard to find. Uh, there wasn't much room for a sign because of the small narrow streets. So there was a blank wall there. We said, well, do like a Trump Loy style mural that directed into the, the, the parking garage. And this fits the character of the place. You know, we, we did it so that it sort of fits in. Creating landmark elements that are not only of the of its place, but also things that can go on Instagram and potentially, you know, go out to the rest of the country. Um, we always look at digital elements when we do uh, uh, systems as well. Uh, in this case, this is in Newark, New Jersey, where you have physical elements of a walking uh, trail, um, but you also have a digital app as well. You could scan a QR code to get the app. Um, and it also can count your steps as you're walking and see how many calories you burned. So those are just examples of, uh, you know, things that you could do with a wayfinding system. Um, just sort of giving you visuals of what to expect when we're doing this, this project. Um, I just briefly want to go through our design process. And it's, you know, if you've ever gone through a planning project or an architectural project, these are similar. Uh, it's a similar uh, step process, but there's the strategy, uh, you know, who gets included, you know, what are the wayfinding routes, what are the districts, then the wayfinding, you know, where do signs go, what do they say, and then, of course, the design, you know, where we want to capture the character of the place um, and, and, and create a uniform design that, that goes across all wayfinding tools. Uh, like I said, we're very familiar with the DOT, DOT guidelines and community wayfinding. Where you know there's uh, three messages per panel. Actually, in Connecticut, I think you can go up to five messages per panel. We we did that in New Haven uh, because they had done that before uh, from a vehicular standpoint. But we don't necessarily recommend doing that. But in certain cases, you can uh, approved using approved typefaces, arrow style, arrow location, reflective background, copy heights depending on the speed that you're traveling, uh, background and copy contrasts, and using breakaway posts as well. So, I mean, we're, we know the MUTCD uh, in and out, so we'll be able to apply that to this system and have approvals with um, Connecticut DOT. Our methodology, like I said, is a uh, uh, sort of a uh, six step process where in, during phase one, which we are in now, we, we have not even gotten to the point of schematic design yet for this project. We're in, still in the discovery phase. We've had stakeholder meetings and interviews. We came to town, we, we toured, we photographed. Um, we were able to gather information. Uh, we also have an online, we put up an online survey to gather uh, information as well, which I'll go through at the very end of this presentation. But that's the first step that we're in now, the wayfinding analysis. Part of the, that first phase deliverable will be schematic design, where we'll present three design options. Um, and then, um, you know, gather feedback on those on those designs. Then it goes into the planning and design phase where we take the programming, we'll start to go out and look at what are the sign quantities? What are we looking at as far as locations, uh, messaging, terminology? We'll start to do field surveys and then design development. We'll take that approved design direction and then we'll expand it out across all of the wayfinding tools. And then the uh, last phase three is the documentation and implementation. So we will document this system. We'll provide all the specs, all of the materials, call outs, all of the sizes for every uh, science sign type uh, wayfinding tool. Um, and then and then we then the last phase is the bidding and construction um, along the way. Um, you'll see little dollar signs on our chart here. We're always looking at budget. So we don't want to get to the very end and we've designed a, you know, uh, a Tesla um, that nobody can afford. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're appropriate in what we in what we do. We also will outline it in phases. To, so we'll look at what your priorities will be at the very beginning of this project uh, so that we can then tell you well, this is where you want to invest first, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth, maybe over the years. So um, we, we did a survey, uh, 344 total responses. We might even have a little bit more than that now. Um, but 92% uh, of them were West Hartford residents. 76% uh, lived and work in West Hartford for over 10 plus years. 
Um, we asked all kinds of questions, like what are your hidden gems? Um, the one that came out uh, the most, or the two, actually was Reservoir 58 mentions, Westmore Park 55, Parks, Elizabeth Park. So your outdoor uh, you know, parks and outdoor use uh, came in a lot uh, under hidden gems. Um, so we also asked, you know, for general comments, pedestrian safety is a huge concern. Uh, you know, we always get the, you know, living here is wonderful type comments. Uh, wayfinding should be unified with the brand. And these were just some of the, the comments that we got. We got a whole bunch of them that we're, we're going to use to formulate and create our, um, our designs and our, and our wayfinding plan. Um, the one uh, thing that came out of all, a lot of our um, uh, stakeholder meetings were because we want to try and identify districts when we do this project because we want to identify from a distance because we're like we said we're only allowed so many messages per sign panel, you know, from a distance you want to direct to a district and then when you get to a district you direct to parking or a destination, um, so it kind of drills down 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 to get you to where you need to go. Um, one of the things that we noticed was with West Hartford Center and Blueback Square, um, we asked simply a question, um, I include Blueback Square as an area within West Hartford Center, or I consider Blueback Square an adjacent and separate district to the center. 51% said that they consider it part of West Hartford Center, and 49% said that it was uh, considered it adjacent or a separate district. Um, so that's something that I think is going to be one of the big questions that we have as we do this program. You know, do we direct to both of those things as separate districts or is it all considered West Hartford Center? Um, best mode of transportation, uh, I think it's clear it's a car, 64%, but it was interesting that 23% were pedestrian. Um, we've got 5% bike use, which I think is pretty good. Um, you know, public transit was 2%. Um, walking to a destination, what's the maximum distance you would consider? Uh, 10 plus minutes, which I think is probably um, higher, I think, than most communities where it's usually up to 10 minutes. So uh, I thought that that was interesting as well. Um, on a scale of one to find, how difficult is it to, um, I move my screen here, blocking, to find available parking? Um, and I think that, um, you know, moderate or somewhat easy or, or difficult. So there's kind of a mix there as well. So I think parking is definitely an issue. I think that, you know, with with parking garages that aren't always open with, um, you know, parking lots that maybe are behind businesses. Um, I think that that's something that we're going to have to resolve and we're going to have to look at. Um, digital tools, would you consider and enhance a visitor experience, uh, mobile apps, website, um, interactive kiosk real-time info like parking or transit seemed also scored pretty high when doing this um yeah so with that uh that's just sort of our quick you know summary of what we're, where we are what we're doing you know we're we're still in like we said like i said we're still in the discovery phase so we're just really looking for um insight or things that might um uh, um, you know, that might help us al along the way. So with that, um, any questions? And we'll try and answer anything that you have. Might want to stop sharing now, so. There we go. Sorry, I was uh, just sharing my story. Uh, thank you for that uh, explanation as to uh, the process, uh, the services that uh, can be offered with respect to this uh, this project and where we are currently. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's very clear to me that we're uh, still in that beginning stage and uh, a lot more work needs to be done. So at this point, we'll open up to uh, questions uh, from town councilors. Any, any questions? Mr. Winograd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davidoff. Um, just, um, we've got a, a few different, um, consultants operating right now. Um, obviously we have the, the big, um, Centac, the center, uh, study going on, um, and a lot of results out of that and surveys from there as well. Um, it, 
not in the same level, but the um, Vision Zero as well for pedestrian um, bike safety and road safety is also doing, I, I think, some similar work. Is there any way um, the various groups can be talking to each other as well? It seems like your plan is going to have a lot of interface with what do we end up doing with the center, um, and including again some of the same questions about what pe what people's vision is of of those areas. So just wondering how we can make sure all our groups are that are studying the town are working together. Um, yeah, Kristen, you can maybe answer that or. <laughs> yeah, I can answer that. So um, I see that our community development director, Dwayne Martin, is on here as the project manager for the center infrastructure master plan. So um, I have been working um, directly with Stantec and Dwayne to communicate where we are in terms of wayfinding signage and then vice versa um, in terms of where the center infrastructure master plan is with merge. Um, so we have connected the consultants to have conversations as we get a little bit further into both projects. And then I just wanna note that we intend to bring in other stakeholder groups such as bicycle pedestrian committee, but it was really, although we are in this beginning stage of the project, it was really important for us to be able to bring this overview to the council at this early stage before moving forward and before meeting with other larger stakeholder groups and uh, other kind of subcommittees of the town. So those are things that are kind of next on the discovery phase and bucket list before we move into that schematic design. I want to thank you, Ms. Gorski. Mr. Reningrad, anything further? No, no, thank you for. Thank you for a good question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sedanowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for that presentation, Glenn. Great, great presentation. Um, we, you know, obviously we're West Hartford, but we also um, colloquially go as WEHA, w, capital W-E-H-E, or H-A. And um, I don't know, you know, that's, I guess, a research um, dilemma. Do we use that in the signage? Um, are you aware of it, that we were going by it? And, and if you're not, that's fine, too. Um, and I would throw that out to everyone else on this. You know, I don't know if that's something that we want to be known for 20 years from now or anything, but it is something that's current, kind of taken a, um, a life of its own where, you know, we're known as WEHA now. Um, you know, I guess that proverbial round bumper sticker that that most towns, go, you know, go to. So I just wondered if that could be incorporated. And then I know that this is in the, you know, crawl, walk, run phase, the crawl piece. And, you know, when we're talking about building a community center um, down the road and how would you incorporate future um, buildings, um, town buildings uh, like that one um, in your plan? And, you know, say if we were to start putting signs up uh, a year from now, but that community center is two, three years out, how do we handle that? Do we do it, you know, in stages? And if you just talk us kind of through that. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, you know, cities are always changing, right? Towns are always changing. Uh, we are aware of the community center, and we we would consider that to be incorporated into the plan currently as part of the system. You know, our plan, uh, from a timeline standpoint, we'll be working on this through the year, and then implementation would probably happen. You know, sometime, maybe hopefully, maybe a little bit at the end of this year, and maybe next year as well. So I feel like that we can. And include that as potentially part of the first phase of the system. We also can design things modular uh, from a, a signage system if we know that there's going to be a lot of change and that things are going to be moving. Um, so we can and we can plan for that now as part of it. But we're we are aware of all of those all of those changes that are that are coming on on online um, with with the branding and things like that, like WeHa. Um, you know, we, we, we tend to design things that are timeless, hopefully timeless. Um, but however, if that is something that is, is relevant, you know, we, we can find places to incorporate that into the system. Um, whether that's on a kiosk that can be changed, changed out, or whether that is, um, a panel on a sign that can be changed, you know, you don't necessarily want to just put your logo on everything um you know because if that logo changes or the or the or it goes out of style then you have to update and and change all of those all of those signs so um you know a lot of times we'll take an element 
from you know the town and use that as a design element like um uh you saw the brandywine valley where we have the cutout on the top of you know brandywine valley so it it sort of evokes that you know that that place um so we'll we'll look for opportunity to do it but we also are aware that you know things will change and and we'll we'll be able to you know remove those things if we need to or change them yeah and thank you i appreciate that and that, that makes a lot of sense and that's kind of what did catch my eyes that scrolling piece and then you know even like uh, outside of the weha tag you know we have different sections of town elmwood and things like that so um somehow we've got to incorporate all that it's um into it and i know that this group um is the subject matter experts so i leave it in their hands but just something i i wanted to make aware of thank you mm -hmm. uh thank you mr zanowitz uh the only thing that i would probably add is uh, internally we would need to determine uh, which departments would be responsible uh, going forward uh, for updates and um, installation and, and things of that nature uh, should uh, this progress uh, further down the road uh, would it be public works would it be community development would it be economic development um, because a lot of the pieces are, are moving pieces in terms of uh, whether or not it's a physical sign it's a online platform whether or not it's a, a kiosk so nothing static and and i think in order for it to be very effective the expectation would be that the information stays current up to date because i think the most frustrating thing that people would find with any type of wayfinding is it's outdated okay and once you encounter that once uh you probably just say forget it this this is this doesn't make any sense to me so um not only do we have buy-in with the concept now, but we have to continue that buy-in um, throughout. Um, it, it's just part of our part of who we are. So it's part of our identity, and 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 I guess that's what I would call this. This is basically um, a public-facing identity identity project. Uh, that that's how I look at it. So, um, but I think I think there'd be more discussion probably at staff level to to determine uh, where the various pieces uh, uh, fall and, and how they get implemented. But that's further down the line. But from an initial point, that's something that, that came to my mind immediately that we would definitely have to make certain that we bake into the um, the entire process. So did any of my other colleagues have any questions or comments at this point? Seeing or hearing none, thank you very much. I don't know, Mr. Manager, if you have anything uh, you'd like to add at this point. I want to thank uh, Kristen for her leadership and uh, PMing this uh, very important project for West Hartford and certainly for Merge for their work to date. <laughs> As was stated, we are, you know, in that crawl phase right now, gathering great information. Um, all the players you see on the screen today, uh, to your point, Mr. Davidoff would be involved in any um, you know changes as we move forward signage wise branding wise etc so between mr phillips mr martin and Ms. gorski this is our team who will work together but more to follow uh and we will be back before this committee um you know as things progress on this project so thank you back through you mr chairman uh thank you mr manager okay thank you again uh for the presentation thank you Ms. gorski and um look forward to uh hearing more as this uh, progresses. And I'm certain uh, you'll be um, amazed at the level of engagement that you will get from our community. Uh, our residents and business owners are not shy to present their, their opinions and views. So um, yeah. <laughs> that's, what makes, that's what makes West Hartford such a wonderful place to live and to raise a family yeah. and to work. So yeah. yes. thank you. Great, well, thank you all. Thank you all. And have a great day, have sir. A good, have a good day. Yep, you too. Thanks, bye. Uh, the next item is our out di outdoor dining ordinance update. Uh, I believe it's a five page document uh, currently. And Mr. Manager, I'll let you lead off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, this is a five page ordinance document, but not a document that this committee has not seen. Uh, so we discussed uh, this almost exact ordinance 
uh, outdoor dining ordinance about a year ago when we had plans to move it through the zoning process uh, through Mr. DeMay with the ultimate goal of bringing it to the council for a full vote in the spring. But then you may recall that Governor Lamont signed legislation in March of last year um, allowing the relaxed rules uh, for outdoor dining that were established during the pandemic to continue um, through this year. So those expire on April 30th of 2023. So um, when this order does expire on uh, April 30th, outdoor dining will be, uh, shall be allowed as, a, as of right, uh, shall be allowed on public sidewalks, um, potentially off street parking spaces uh, associated with restaurants. So um, in order to comply with this, we needed to uh, make some minor amendments to our ordinance, um, which again, as I said, is something we went through in, in, in detail last year, but um, what I would do through you, Mr. Chairman, is turn it over to our town planner, Mr. Dumay, who can uh, quickly summarize some of those changes um, as they are. Through you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dumay. Thank you, Mr. Ledwith. Mr. Ledwith uh, accurately summarized this ordinance is nearly identical to that that went through the CPED and actually formal um, receipt process and was set for hearing. Uh, one of the reasons um, that we chose to hold off on its adoption was at the time, this was February of last year, we were unclear what the governor would do in terms of um, a permanent change were fixed to outdoor dining. They extended the COVID protocols through the end of April of this year, but effective May 1st, as Mr. Ledwith said, uh, outdoor dining must be allowed to be permitted as of right. So really the principal change to our outdoor dining ordinances, we have three different types, are to transition the way that we approve them historically. So our program goes back to the early 2000s. So we have over 20 years of experience with outdoor dining, but most of it was through a special use permit process. That process is a public hearing process that's administered by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, that no longer would be allowed under state statute. So this ordinance takes that and creates a site plan, which is an administrative approval process. If you demonstrate compliance with the standards contained, um, any restaurant could get approval. Uh, it does that for outdoor dining that required an SUP. It also transitions another type of outdoor dining that we had that was a zoning permit process for um, outdoor dining areas that had less than 16 seats or did not serve alcohol. Creates that, moves that into the same process. And then lastly, um, this ordinance, and we had discussed it last year, um, contemplates um, some amendments to um, our street right of way dining program under John Phillips authority under section 155. Um, that was a provision that historically was not used pre COVID. It allowed for outdoor dining in public rights of way uh, prior to COVID that was limited to sidewalks. So there are many areas throughout the center and Blueback Square where you think you might be on a public sidewalk, you might be on a private sidewalk, but the ordinance always allowed for outdoor dining to exist in the public portion of the sidewalk, although it was not utilized. So this would update that section of the ordinance as well. And I, in the materials before you, it's, it's called optional. Um, the reason that we listed that, you know, depending on the outcome of our West Harford Center Master Plan Infrastructure Study, it may or may not be necessary if we're creating new outdoor dining opportunities um, off street within the public right of way, that, that piece um, needs to be more carefully considered, I would suggest. Uh, in addition, we had discussed previous issues regarding maintenance, operation, logistical, and fiscal impacts associated with, in particular, on street dining. So the ordinance that went before the council last year uh, essentially created a mechanism whereby the council could, by resolution, establish a fee for on-street outdoor dining. So I, that, that's that been carried forward, and it's probably the only point of discussion that we, I think staff was looking for some feedback on. Does anyone have any questions about the uh, proposed outdoor dining ordinance. Mr. Zanowitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just the one, it says um, in, in uh, 
paragraph one, it says in underline identified by a fixed barrier. Um, just wondering, like, John, I don't know if this is you or, or who, who would address this, but I know we did away with the orange water filled barriers, I think, and we went to concrete. And I, I was always hesitant of the orange ones, um, the plastic, because, you know, they're really supposed to um, stop vehicular traffic. And I was always concerned about that if those were robust enough to do that in case there was outdoor dining in a car happened to uh, veer off. So I, I wondered if if that fixed barrier means concrete and, um, you know, secured into the ground through rebar or is it just I, just concerned about that? I always have been and I, now I have an opportunity to talk about it. So. John Phillips, Director of Public Works. Great question, uh, Mark. Um, it, it's a combination of both. Um, the, 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 we, we tend to use the concrete fixed barriers on Farmington Avenue with traffic speeds tend to be a little higher, especially where you're coming on the approaches uh, from the west into West Hartford Center. Um, and we'll use the plastic barriers um, uh, um, on the directional side where traffic's pulling away from the barriers, right? So it's a combination of uh, the plastic barriers just give you more flexibility to tie it back into the curb so you can bring it in and give it delineation, um, high visibility delineation. Um, concrete, uh, the water barriers we're using on LaSalle Road where traffic is much more slower and, and tamer as far as point to point and going from, you know, uh, Arapahoe to uh, Farmington Avenue. <clears throat> um, so it's been a combination. None of these barriers are, fill, are, are, are secured to the street. So um, a high impact crash would even move the concrete ones, um, but obviously a high impact crash would 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 uh, uh, be worse with the, with the plastic ones, obviously. Um, but that's so that's what we're we're doing. But I think the the ordinance uh, contemplates the concrete style barriers. Mr. Chairman, if I may, through you to Mr. Zdanowitz, um, that provision, the addition of the term fixed barrier, really applies to the sidewalk dining. Um, so if we think about the historic use of outdoor dining, it's been in sidewalk areas. And the reason that language is installed is we've had a problem and had a um, continue to receive complaints from residents over lack of uh, ADA compliant access uh, paths on sidewalks. So the outdoor dining enclosures, it could be a simple fence. That's really what that's referring to. The barrier is the fence around the outdoor dining area. If it's not fixed to the sidewalk, meaning it's usually a pin mount, uh, they have the habit of migrating further and further out into the sidewalk area, and then we create uh, numerous pinch points with tree pits, street lights throughout the sidewalk, and then we don't have an environment that's accessible and open to all pedestrians uh, walking through the center. That's really what that term is, is referring to. Um, the issue you raised um, is kind of covered under Section 155, so that's Section 3 of the ordinance, whereby it authorizes Mr. Phillips to create um, a series of outdoor designing for in the right of way or in street guidelines. And this would allow him to address the issue of, of what's an appropriate safe enclosure for you know any dining that could be in the street. All right, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Mr. Winograd. Uh, thank you. Um, through you to. Uh, uh, so I guess the question is that it, it, it saying that um, the fee structure was the one thing that you thought was still you're still looking for um, counsel from us on that. Um, can you? Is the question whether or not we think there should be charges for that, or because at this point. Um, it's kind of about the flexibility and in part, we'll have to see what happens with the whole infrastructure project anyway, to see whether that's still going to be something that is going to be needed or whether or not we're going to be providing enough uh, sidewalk access that that really won't be the thing anymore. I, the street might be too narrow at that point. So I guess I'm, I'm not sure. I think that the ordinance as written is fine because it gives the option, um, but uh, do we have, do you want to have that discussion about, you know, whether or not if someone takes over a parking spot, they should be charged for it? We can have is that. Do we need that now, or is it too soon for that that talk? Mr. Chairman, through you to Mr. Winograd, I, I don't think that discussion needs to happen now. I simply wanted to point um, to the provision that you know, was forward thinking that said the council may establish that fee structure. 
obviously this year it will be kind of a, a bit of a transitional year, but you know, going forward and, and looking to the future, depending on the outcome of all of these other studies, including the infrastructure master plan, there may not be the opportunity or the need for that in-street uh, provision. So I just want to make sure everyone was comfortable with the way the language was written that it authorizes the council to, in the future, establish um, that, that fee structure should it be necessary. I know Mr. Yeah. Woodworth had his hand up, so I'll, I'll, I'll defer to him for any further discussion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Demain. You're, you're exactly right. So there, and you may recall last year when we were talking about moving this ordinance through, we were also talking about the potential of um, some fee structure for restaurants taking advantage of the on-street parking. Um, so there is, as we talked about last year, which would still be in place for this year, would be a loss of revenue for those parking spots, uh, which is, you know, totals around $130,000 in lost revenue. And then there's um, the cost to um, to set up the barrier structures uh, as, as they've existed over the last couple of years. Um, so the painting of the barriers, the placement of the barriers, shutting down the streets, overtime from public works and uh, police department, things like that. So there is a cost to to do this. And a year ago, we contemplated whether you know whether we would want to charge restaurants a, for example, a per per spot fee. Um, so that could be something that we still explore um, with with the restaurants and with obviously with the council first. Uh, but we, we really have two steps here. The first is the ordinance, get the ordinance through. Uh, at the same time, we can continue to discuss whether a resolution uh, setting up a fee structure would be appropriate. This, you know, this also would be potentially the last year of, to Mr. Dumay's point, of on-street um, dining. So with the infrastructure project, as you know, our vision is to extend the sidewalks, uh, particularly on LaSalle, out another 10 feet on each side, uh, providing restaurants with more sidewalk space um, for outdoor dining. So long term vision is we won't see that dining extending out into the street. So we're you know, essentially talking about one more year of setting up the barriers and, and allowing um, the on street dining experience that we've uh, offered our residents and visitors for the last couple of years. So I'll pause there. Any follow up questions? Happy to uh, to respond to those. Uh, thank you. No, I guess um, I I think the issue is probably moot, and I don't know that you know we're likely to have that discussion about fees this year. Um, I I understand and certainly agree that there are fixed costs for us. Obviously, the the, the staff time and and putting on the barriers and all that sort of thing. And just certain logic to seeking to recoup some of that money from the restaurants. I disagree on the the costing out of losing a parking spot. I, I don't think that's a fair um, calculation in that if you block a parking spot, either for construction or anything else, um, there's other parking. So it, it may be an inconvenience. It might be a problem for um, retailers if if people can't park right in front of their store. But the people who are d displaced from an, an on-street parking, either leaving, which I guess is one possibility, or they're parking somewhere else in one of our other lots or garages, and we're still getting the same money. So I, I you know, since we don't have a differential cost, we're not we don't charge more. For the on street parking um, at this point, I don't really see that calculation. I, I just think that it, we put out a number like 130,000 per year for I, it, gives an impression of a subsidy that I don't really think is existing. Because again, I think people that we know from other studies that there is available parking elsewhere in the center. Um, and it, it, it's just moving it. Again, lots of reasons why people might not like it for the inconvenience and all that, but I, I don't think it's an economic issue except for those barrier placements and other work that John's department is putting in. Thank you, Mr. Warnegret. Understood. And uh, yeah, as I said, you know, we're looking, it was really to, to, you know, move the ordinance through. And we did have this conversation last year. And certainly if, if the council wanted to engage in that conversation this year, we could certainly do that. Thank you. Thank you. 
any further uh, questions or comments on the outdoor dining ordinance? Mr. Zan, what's I, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Is that, um, you know, Rick, I appreciate that we'll talk about this and Ben um, uh, about the outdoor dining and, and the, the revenue that we're losing as a town. I think it's a discussion that we should have forward, go forward with because, you know, um, there's an, a, an opportunity of um, that we're losing as a town. And then I brought this up in previous meetings that, uh, you know, this is for outdoor dining. What about the business right next door to them? What's their advantage? What what advantage do they get? And if we have, you know, if we want to treat them all equitable, that uh, there's got to be some skin in the game. But I just wanted to say that, just reiterate what Rick said, is that, that so we can have a discussion about this and all of us can be um, engaged in it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zanowitz. Uh I think it's really appropriate that an ordinance concerning outdoor dining is being discussed during my last uh, CPED meeting because in the early 2000s, uh, I was on the zoning commission and sat through many uh, special use permits. And now that it's uh, gone full circle uh, to become a use as of as of right, um, I, I think I think this is important to say uh, when the council adopted an outdoor dining ordinance in the early 2000s. Um, it was felt that that would be a way to revitalize the center and bring economic development uh, to West Hartford. And um, I think the council was proving right. Uh, we have become um, a model um, uh, community in Connecticut and throughout the nation. Uh, it demonstrates how uh, outdoor dining has drawn people to our community and the economic impact of of that activity of dining outside has been able to spill over into the various districts where it's been allowed. So the growth of our um, retail, our restaurant community, not only in the center where it was initially focused, but in our other districts as well, whether it be uh, Park Road, Elmwood, Corbin's Corner, Bishop's Corner, uh, has just been magnified uh, by the foresight that people had over 20 years ago to permit this activity outside. And um, I think the mayor was involved early on uh, with that ordinance, and uh, it has been a, a game changer. And West Hartford has become a foodie destination. And why people want to locate their restaurants here in West Hartford is because we have demonstrated over the years our commitment to doing it right, uh, to making it a positive dining experience uh, where people have high quality restaurants, a variety of restaurants um, where you can enjoy the experience from the minute you're seated to the minute you leave. And then you can feel safe walking around in the various districts um to uh, walk off what you just ate so um and we've been able to accomplish this and i think this is important um on such a grand scale and i think Ms. gorski can attest to it there's probably many many establishments that wish they could find a space in west hartford uh to uh, be successful in their uh, various business uh, endeavors so um I think it's been a great job of uh, reworking this. Um, I'm glad to see that live amplified music uh, has been added uh, to that because I think that just detracts from uh, the experience. Uh, you're going out, you're spending a sizable amount of money and you just want to have a conversation, relax with your family and friends and not be distracted um, in, in an outdoor setting. Um, so uh, thank you to uh, Corporation Council and to all those uh, Obviously, I'm certain in the planning office and, and, and community development uh, who have had input uh, in this. And uh, Mr. Phillips will have a, a greater stake going forward with respect to how this looks in the in the public right of way. But um, this this ordinance, though, in my opinion, changed the character of the town of West Hartford for the better and, and put us on the map. I, I really seriously believe that if you just go do some research from over 20 years ago, what the state of our center was. And this is pre-Blueback Square. You, you will probably come to that same conclusion. 
So anyone else have any further questions or comments on the outdoor dining? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is Mary Faye. Uh, thanks for that. And of course I support this. It is a game changer. Uh, I know many of people, including my family, if we have a choice to dine out um, inside or outside in nice weather, of course we wanna be outside. I think it was great during COVID. It really helped keeping keep these businesses going. Uh, where it was tough to locate everybody inside. Um, so it's a very much a win-win. My question has always been, and I've raised this before as well, um, I know it's harder in other parts of town, but what can we do to expand? I think the ordinance is fine. It, w it would cover that within this. But is there other plans that we can do for, um, well, Park Road's pretty good, but other places in Elmwood or um, I think about like Beachland Tavern or some other places that are very limited for outdoors. Uh, I just want to kind of think about that for the future of what we can do for other sections of town. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Ms. Faye. Yeah. Mr. Dumay, Mr. Manager. Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to uh, Ms. Faye. Uh, the ordinance actually does think about other areas of town. We know that uh, certain areas of town have more substantial sidewalk widths than other areas, but what this ordinance does is allows areas that don't it allows opportunities for restaurant tours to utilize parking spaces and parking lots for outdoor dining and create vibrant experiences. So it, it fortunately is pretty forward thinking in that it, it recognizes that all areas and all locations don't have the same characteristics, but it carves out new opportunity that didn't exist previously. Um, and we did have a couple of provisions. One that comes to mind um, down in Elmwood is Doral Marketplace. You know, for the past few years, they've utilized um, several parking spaces in front of their establishment and created a little vibrant outdoor dining area. And this would allow those type of opportunities to any other restaurants um, in similar situations. Thank you, Mr. Dumais. Anything further, Ms. Faye? Okay, thank you very much. I think that uh, basically concludes this topic and uh, I I saw thank that. Oh, thank you, Ms. Faye. I saw that there was an ordinance amending the special flood hazard area standards, uh, Mr. Ledwith, in the packet, but it's not listed on the agenda. So, uh, can we take oh, that up as the communications? Sure. I thought it was uh, spelled out in the agenda, Mr. Chairman. So we'll just take that up under communications. From, take it up from under the communications. Office. All right, that'd be great. So I this think, is. Yeah, uh, I think Corporation Council will have no objection that we, we do it under that segment. Okay, thank you. I can see a nod from Ms. Ferrano. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ledwith, please proceed. Sorry about that. Um, so this is uh, amendment amendment as you said that um, amending men's our special flood hazard area standards, uh, which will allow us to remain eligible for participation and as a class eight community in the. Um, community rating system program. So the CRS program is an incentive program that recognizes uh, community floodplain management practices that exceed minimum uh, requirements in the national flood insurance program. Uh, fortunately, we have our town planner, Mr. DeMay here, who could uh, summarize um, the change that is required due to a um, change that occurred back in January of 2021. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, I'll refer to our town planner, Mr. Dumay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ledwith. So the town has historically participated in this community rating system program, and we have successfully done so and been recognized and we're rated as a class eight community. What that means is any property owner who is required to carry flood insurance or wishes to purchase it, because they're in a special flood hazard area. A special flood hazard area is an area identified by FEMA through a firm, which is a flood insurance rate map, as having a statistical high probability of a flood event um, in a 100 year term. And there's two different types of flood zones in the community. Um, one is a zone A, one is a zone AE. There's, there's a discrepancy in terms of the data, uh, zone AE is just a, a flood zone that has an elevation established. Um, so if you're required to carry flood insurance because of the town's proactive flood management efforts, um, rate and insurance policy holders get a 10% discount on those premiums. And that's our participation in the system. Every five years we get 
uh, an inspection and an audit from our partners um, at ISO and FEMA to look at our compliance with what we're supposed to be doing and in proactive efforts. One of the things that we um, knew was coming up was uh, this issue, this new change to the base standard to continue to participate in the program requires that we update and have a higher regulatory standard. What the two ordinance amendments say is if someone was looking to construct a new construction um, or a substantial improvement, they would have to currently elevate that home or building two feet above whatever the flood elevation is. And we've done that for a number of years. The change was uh, that now the bottom of all electrical heating, ventilation, air conditioning, any associated equipment with that home has to also be elevated two feet above base flood elevation. Um, and really the purpose behind this uh, and the theory to participate in this program is to reduce and avoid flood damage to any insurable property and to help protect lives and, and property. And that standard would seek to do that. And in addition, although this doesn't apply in West Hartford, um, but we're required to state that if we have any manufactured homes that the bottom frame of the lowest floor of any manufactured home has to be above two feet. So with those two changes, we'll comply with the new requirement uh, to ensure that our higher regulatory standards are, are being held. Uh, this wouldn't really impact anyone that's currently under construction. It could theoretically impact. Um, we have several hundred properties that are in a zone A or zone AE, but it would only impact them if they were coming in for a substantial improvement. And a substantial improvement is if they were looking to improve more than 50% of the value of the home. Uh, in that instance, we need to treat that improvement as basically a new construction and then the home would have to be elevated above that standard. Um, the, the best way to describe this is some of the recent hurricanes in Florida. If you saw some of the post hurricane damage and you saw some homes that were completely devastated based on flooding and in those instances, it was coastal inundation flooding. Um, there were some homes that were standing. They were up on piers or pylons. Um, those were homes that were built um, in, in those communities with these higher standards. So they were built above the flood elevation height. Um, so that's that's the the analogy to what our, our ordinance is looking to do here. And with that, I'll stop for any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dumay. Any questions from any committee members or other counselors? Uh, not seeing any. So it seems very technical in nature, Mr. Dumay. And uh, I think that the applicability of uh, this change, though, will be quite limited, as you pointed out, uh, to those who are making substantial improvements to over 50% of their um, building structure currently. So the impact uh, is not great, but uh, it will provide um, uh, the necessary protection uh, for the homeowners in, in those areas. So I think I think it makes a lot of common sense to, to adopt this ordinance. And uh, I presume that this at some point will be put on a council agenda for, for action, correct, Mr. Manager? It will, yes, Mr. Chairman. And I forgot to ask with the outdoor dining that which should be set for public hearing soon too, I guess. Yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, if I could just add one one other item, I was uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention that this ordinance, the Special Flood Hazard Area Ordinance, is consistent with the Plan of Conservation Development um, and a specific strategy in our Open Space and Environment section to promote sustainable stormwater and floodplain management. And even more specifically, there are two action items um, to review and evaluate our current special flood hazard area zoning ordinances to ensure consistency with the FEMA recommended model, which we're doing here. And then also we have a recommendation and action to participate in FEMA's CRS program and work towards increasing our rating up to category seven. If we were able to achieve that, um, that discount to our insurance holders in the community would go up to 15%. So this ordinance is one step towards um, some action items in the plan of conservation and development. Yeah, thank you for um, pointing those things out and uh, the cost savings to those who have to uh, procure flood insurance uh, would be greatly appreciated. Okay, seeing nothing further, the uh, next item is a staff report and uh, we have a very detailed report uh, prepared by Mr. Martin under the community development update. So, uh, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will refer to Mr. Martin, our director of community development to provide a uh, 
summary of his report. I believe he will uh, refer to our town engineer for a portion of it as well, Greg Summer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. About halfway through the meeting, my WebEx just crashed on me, so I apologize. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to cover a few items for community development, and then I'll turn it over to Greg Summer, our town engineer. Uh, Tim McCloach, our chief building official, was here earlier, but he had a run. Uh, the building division is, is very busy, as you guys are probably well aware. There's been a lot of activity and some staffing challenges, as, as I'll uh, classify them. Um, but I'll touch on first our West Hartford Center Infrastructure Master Plan. We held our second public workshop, and it was really well attended. This was on February 2nd. There was about 80 people that attended, and uh, we received a lot of great feedback. The presentation went a little long, but there was a lot of content to cover. And we also had a flurry of emails uh, from people that were not able to attend the meeting. A lot of positive comments. A lot of people enjoyed the... Uh, concepts for LaSalle Road and Farmington Ave and even some of the potential projects that could come uh, at the big intersection of Farmington and Main or down South Main Street. So a lot more to come on that. The consultant Santec will continue with the designs focusing mostly on LaSalle Road and Farmington Ave as those are going to be designed for reconstruction coming up and there's still a lot of ground to cover on those. We have added new content to the project webpage. I encourage everybody to go there. The Public workshop recording is there, uh, or just simply the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation that was displayed during the workshop is also posted there. Uh, so more to come with regards to that project. Wanted to touch on our stormwater management program. It's not something that I've talked about, I don't think, before. It is something that is in our operating budget, so you'll see that in the community development budget as a line item. Uh, it is a very involved program. We've been doing this now for years through a state permit requirement. Uh, the basis of it is to keep our water courses and water bodies clean in town as well as throughout the state and Long Island Sound. So it's a very important program and we do a good job to stay on top of this permit. A lot of it involves water testing and then addressing any results that are not up to what they should be as far as exceedances. We do still have areas of town where we have issues that we're trying to correct. A lot of it is related to cross connections between sanitary and storm sewer systems. Not necessarily intentional. And sometimes we've encountered things that have been there for many, many years, but we had to uh, still act on them to address those. And that program will continue for many years to come. Sorry about that. Uh, last thing I want to touch on is department staffing. I mentioned it for the building division. This is something that we've been struggling with, with with the high level of activity that's going on, partly because of the development, partly just people are investing a lot in the properties, which is great. Specifically with the building division, we had a full-time building inspector leave. We had a part-time building inspector leave. And then we had a couple full-time staff that were dealing with significant medical issues and that required time away from the office or working in a office uh, uh, setting, not being able to do inspections, as was the case with one of the employees. So all of that was going on while we launched our City View online program, which had some bumps and we're still working through some of those challenges. So we are actively pursuing staff, but I just wanted to point this out. So we're looking for a part-time building inspector to fill the, the need of that person that left. We're also looking for a part-time staff assistant to help with the front end getting uh, permits verified and through the system and set up for inspection. Um, we are very appreciative that the town council last night adopted the resolution to bring on an additional full-time building inspector. That will certainly help. And uh, in the planning and zoning division, we are actively recruiting a full-time planning and zoning technician. We have a couple candidates that we are working with through that process, we'll bring on somebody soon. And then again, thank you to the town council for adopting the resolution to bring on a senior planner. This is something that I have been very interested. I know uh, uh, Mr. Ledwith is also very interested in getting support for our planning and zoning staff, in particular for our town planner, Todd DeMay. 
Um, that's my portion of the department report. If you have any questions on that before we go to Greg Summers. Any questions for Mr. Martin? Uh, no, it uh, was very thorough in your presentation uh, that was on paper and uh, your verbal presentation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Summers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Greg Summer, Town Engineer. I uh, just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of our roadway resurfacing projects that we have coming up uh, in our first round of paving in May. Um, total of five streets, um, Garfield, Brunswick, Clifton. Um, those are uh, primarily local residential streets. Um, the two that I wanted to focus on was Boulevard uh, between Mountain to Riggs, and then also Trout Brook from Asylum to Albany. Um, as you're aware, as part of our complete street policy, uh, which the council adopted, anytime we're doing a, a roadway resurfacing project, uh, we're always looking at ways to incorporate bicycle facilities. Um, with Boulevard, uh, currently obviously has uh, two parking lanes on either side and 12 foot travel lanes. Uh, so in, in total, it's about 40 feet wide. Um, so we're looking at creative ways to try and accommodate a uh, bicycle facility um, without you know, kind of balancing that mix between uh, maintaining parking uh, for the residents, but also uh, providing a, a safe bicycle facility. Uh, the proposal that we're uh, looking to put forward would be to maintain a, a eight foot parking lane on the north side of the street. Uh, we'd reduce those 12 foot travel lanes to 10 feet um, in each direction. And then what that would do is leave us about 12 feet on the south side of the street. Uh, we'd have a, a two foot buffer and then a, a cycle track. So we'd have both uh, directions of, of cycling, um, five feet wide lanes um, for, for bicyclists in each direction, uh, again, along that, that south curb line. Um, we do have some the bump outs uh, along Boulevard, which provide a, a pedestrian benefit. So we our, our preference is not to uh, disturb those, uh, but we recognize that that bike lane um, would kind of get to be a little pinch point at the intersections where um, you basically have about seven feet um, where we'd be looking for those two bike lanes to to run concurrently. So um, I, I, it would probably it, would, it should work, um, but we recognize that. That it's a, it's a little bit of a pinch point, but the likelihood that you have uh, two cyclists and a, and a vehicle all at that that same uh, point uh, in time uh, is properly uh, pretty unlikely. Uh, but that's something we could always um, revisit in the future if if we get that that feedback um, that that's creating an issue. So um, that's the approach there. The plan would be to to take that to the pedestrian and bicycle commission, share our approach with them uh, in their next meeting in March, and then send letters to the the neighborhood. Uh, informing them of, of the uh, proposed change um, in advance of the resurfacing work in May. So um, we feel like it's a good compromise, good solution there. Um, but I'm sure that we'll we'll hear some feedback uh, from both the PVC as well as as the neighborhood. So I wanted to to make the committee aware of this um, in case there are any questions or concerns that come up. We'd probably, like I mentioned. Um, the extent the project is really the, the resurfacing is from mountain to rigs. Um, it would probably make sense to extend that that pavement treatment, uh, at least the markings, all the way to South Main Street. And what that would do is give us a full uh, continuous um, bike lane in the eastbound direction, all the way from Sunset Triangle, um, where Boulevard comes into to Farmington Avenue, all the way out to uh, Prospect Avenue at the town line. Um, you'd also have that same. Um, Bike connectivity westbound, uh, but it's a little bit of a shared approach. Um, there's sections of it where you don't have a necessarily a dedicated bike lane. So, um, again, this would be a, a two-way cycle track that would be buffered. It wouldn't be protected at this point. Um, that's something again we could look into in the future um, if we get that feedback from the uh, from the PBC. Um, and that's not without challenges. But um, again, kind of starting starting off slow, and and we can always. Uh, enhance our, our facility in the future. With regards to Trout Brook, um, obviously we have the the uh, Yukon uh, parcel that's that's coming in for a redevelopment. Um, so really, you know, it's kind of cart before the horse. Our, our plan would be to to basically put the pavement markings back the way they are. Uh, we're hoping to extend the Trout Brook Trail um, up to Asylum Avenue this year, and then work with the development to uh, continue that through their property. Uh, at least get it up to to Lawler. Um, so with all those uh, pieces in in play, um, 
this probably isn't the, the most appropriate time to to try and modify the pavement markings on Tropic Drive. So our approach would be to, to put them back the way they are with the, the standard um, four lane configuration. And then we can always revisit that in the future um, as this development kind of unfolds and, and takes shape. Uh, so that would be our approach there. Uh, I'd welcome any any questions or comments from the committee. Anybody have any questions or comments for Mr. Summers? Mr. Winograd. Um, a couple things, uh, and thank you for the report. And yeah, I, it was an interesting proposal on on Boulevard, and I'm happy to see you know some creativity there in terms of coming up with different things. And certainly, those lanes are way too wide, and this is going to help. Um, obviously, with some calming, I think. Um, I do think. I, I, do we have any examples of two lane bike lanes that are not sort of separate and protected? Um, even in other towns, I'm not familiar with that. That is, seems a little, it's creative, but I, I, I'm just trying to picture in my head whether anybody else has that sort of thing that, without protection. I, I'd have to do a little more research to, to find out. I know New Haven has done some. Um, I believe they've add, added the delineation. Um, I've talked with um, you know, Director of Public Works, John Phillips. Um, you know, I think we both have some concerns in this location, given the uh, number of residential properties and driveways. Um, where it creates some challenges um, for delivery vehicles, um, you know, being able to, to you know pull in to, the, to that bike area for a short duration. Um, also, the maintenance aspect of it, um, you know, both um, you know routine sweet, street sweeping, but then also uh, winter maintenance as well, um, you know, creates some some challenges. Um, you know, whereas we were proposing this on New Park Avenue, um, you don't necessarily have that. It's a, it's a little bit different, so. Um, that's why we're, you know, like to, you know, try it out, and then we can always um, revisit the need to to install ballers potentially in the future. Uh, thank you. Um, and then just the other question on Trout Brook, um, how far? I, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble pulling up the report right now. Um, how far is that project? Does it go all the way to Farmington Avenue? On, on Trout Brook, it, the paving limits are from Asylum Avenue up to Albany Avenue. Albany, that, okay, that northern block. Um, through the Yukon campus, uh, former Yukon site, all the way up to, to Albany. Okay. And so um, in that area, obviously there's at some point, it's been kind of waiting for Godot to get the plans for the uh, uh, development of that site. Um, I know in much earlier in incarnations of that plan, there were ideas from a, the prior developer as to what to do with the street there. Um, it, do we have a risk of sort of jumping ahead of ourselves with paving there compared to, you know, and, and seeing what's going to be going on, what requests are going to be made in whatever comes down there? Or, or do we think that we're kind of okay with that based on the planning process that's happened so far? Yeah, un unfortunately, given the condition of the pavement, um, you know, I, I don't want to wait and necessarily, you know, if we're waiting for the development and, you know, it gets, uh, gets stalled or it's a longer process than we anticipate, um, we really want to make sure, given the, the high volumes and the arterial uh, traffic that we experience, um, we think it's appropriate to, to resurface it now, um, recognizing that, yeah, unfortunately, it may get, uh, you know, reconstructed um, as part of that project, whether they do some widening or, or you know, shifting of the roadway. Um, we also have our, our culvert project, which may impact it. Um, but one of the things we might look at doing is just doing a, a, a thinner uh, mill and pave. So, you know, we're, it's, it's almost a, a temporary um, repair. So we do save some costs that way. Great. Thank you. Because, yeah, like I said, it, it's been a number of years, that are not quite as long as Leon's been around, but we certainly keep on hearing about uh, changes and the culvert in particular and, and ideas there. So. Uh, but yet, it, you're right, Tim, it's in bad shape. So um, that sounds appropriate to me to do a thinner. Thank you, Mr. Winograd. Anyone further? I would concur that between Asylum and Albany, uh, whatever we can do to improve the condition of that road uh, will be greatly appreciated. Any enhancements. So uh, we've had the road cave in. Uh, it, it's just, it's just, it's, just it's it's time for that to happen and as you rightfully pointed out we have no idea as to when a development will actually uh, kick off so uh, it does make a prudent sense to uh, to address it now 
So thank you. Um, future agenda items, are, are there any? Uh, okay, so I guess I see none. Uh, and before I adjourn, I just uh, wanna just take a moment of uh, personal prerogative. Uh, this, as this is my last CPED meeting, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the people associated with community development, building, engineering, town planning, public works, economic development, and corporation council. Uh, for all the uh, years of uh, guidance and uh, information and uh, honesty, professionalism, and dedication to the town. Um, it, it just shines through uh, in every meeting that uh, the committee has had and all my interactions uh, with each and every one of you has, uh, has been positive and I think uh, it's reflective of the type of community that we are, that uh, we have people of such stellar quality um, working on behalf of our our citizens, our, our business community, and and focused on on what's really really important, and that is uh, making West Hartford the great place that it is to to be. And uh, I, I truly appreciate this. And uh, I, I woke up this morning and I said this will be the last council committee meeting that I will be chairing. And uh, it's a long way from back in uh, 2000 and something when I was chair of the TPZ to today. But um, I know brighter things are on the horizon and I'm looking forward to that. But I really do appreciate everybody's participation. I, I think that's what makes uh, West Hartford unique is the um, ability of everyone to come prepared and to be engaged and to respect people of different opinions and to hear them all out and, and come to resolutions uh, of the various issues that, um, that we face. And this morning was a perfect example of the wide variety of uh, issues uh, that are addressed on a daily basis uh, in each of the, the departments. And um, it, it's just an, a magnificent uh, community. And uh, if one really uh, takes this job as seriously as I've tried to over the years, um, you, you'll just definitely have the appreciation that I've been able to have. So I respect each one of you, and I thank you all for the uh, kindness and the generosity that you've shown me uh, throughout the years. So thank you. And with that, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn and to wish everyone a good day. So moved. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Bye, Joanne. Have a good day. Thank everyone. you. Take care. Thank you, leadership.